everybody, I'm Matt Powers, gardener, seed saver, entrepreneur, permaculturist, best-selling author, and family guy. And I'm here today to talk about why my amaranth shrank while my soils improved. So this is something that, you know, kind of boggles the mind. You know, to some degree, you're like, wait, but my soil's improving, why are certain plants suffering? And you may have seen this, you know, maybe your soils uh, change and you notice certain plants are doing better than others. Uh, it can go in any direction. <laughs> so the reality is uh, my most popular video, and I know I've got videos of Elaine that are more popular than me, but on my channel, the video, the most popular video of me is the amaranth video and I have this giant amaranth growing, but the reason I stopped sharing that seed and circulating it was uh, I, my, 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 my plants continued to shrink every year and I continued to grow it and everything, but I saw as I got better at making good soil happen, I, I had smaller and smaller plants and it wasn't just the amaranth. And so I, I, I struggled to understand what was really going on. And when I learned that these plants were non-mycorrhizal, it started to make sense, but there's more to it. Um, so the thing is that, that amaranth beets, Swiss chard, you know, silver beet is, you know, exposes the truth, right? Swiss chard and amaranth and Swiss chard and beets are the same plant. Um, but it's these plants like this, like brassicas, that are non-mycorrhizal that occupy a pH, an alkaline range, and an EH, sometimes are more oxidized and there's reasons why. And so, all right, so let's get into this because um, these, pr these plants partner with actinomycetes, um, which we now call actinobacteria. Uh, as we've done genetic testing, I mean, you've probably seen the, the family names have changed. You've seen certain plants are being grouped together like amaranth and uh, amaranthacea and kinopodia are now being grouped together. Um, they're both non-mycorrhizal. So, <laughs> so um, the, these, these plants are often partnering with this false fungi that was mistakenly actinomycetes, right? Mistakenly thought for a while to be fungi. So it's filamentous, it has hyphae, but it pushes out the fungi and it kind of, well, it, it totally um, maintains its environment. Um, by maintaining the pH. And, and so, you know, th this is really important to understand. And, and there's also a difference between like stress plants and similar, di difference in similarity between stress plants and the non-mycorrhizal. So the non-mycorrhizal plants are gonna be maintaining that alkaline state. Um, so plants that are getting, you know, alkaline forms of nitrogen are getting, you know, nitrates. So they're expending energy to, to, to transfer that. Um, so they're often very stressed, you know, doing that. And so they, in order to do that and survive in this alkaline environment, they're releasing hydroxide, which is pushing it further alkaline and oxidizing it at the same time. And so um, non-mycorrhizal um, and stressed plants are actually, um, you know, and you might have a buffer of organic matter that you're adding in and kind of holding them in that place, but they can get out of control and be detrimental to soil. So um, the weeds tell you things, but the weeds also do things. So in the damaged soil, those weeds are coming up, they're reinforcing that state of secession and sometimes sitting on things and holding things back with what they're doing. And some plants, you know, don't, don't play nice, you know, and, and uh, put, put things into the environment and put things out uh, attacking other plants um, and they're aggressive. So it's important to, you know, recognize the full palette uh, that we encounter in nature and in our gardens and our farms and our uh, forests. Um, and, and to flip it even more, you know, brassicas are, are reducers. So this is why they're useful as fertilizer, as like a cover crop that, that, that is fertilizing, 
in more alkaline, more oxidized soils. So they, they, do, they do good things, you know, um, but they're not, they're not mycorrhizally um, partnering. And there's some interesting things about that because um, they, they get some, you know, some things from actinobacteria, no doubt. Um, but it being alkaline, it prevents secession and it also prevents a lot of nutrients from being available. So overall, it's poor nutrient structure um, and nutrient access is limited and they're drier overall. So like that's the kind of uh, proclivity that it has, which is, you know, not good for our world to be like that. Um, and we'll get into more into why, but part of the reason why brassicas are hyper accumulators is because they don't have this fungal filter. And this is, um, great, you know, because they, they, you know, can take in all this nutrition, but it's actually also a problem because um, in the remediation world, we know brown mustard is the superstar. You know, uh, your mustard, your kales, your, your cabbage, your, all these things that people have like uh, pointed out have carried uh, problematic things in them, contaminants, toxins, heavy metals. Um, they're hyper accumulators, they, they're non-mycorrhizal, so they, they don't have a filter. And, 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 and so we want to be really careful when we're growing these, if we choose to grow these things, that our soil is really healthy um, and, 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 and really clean, so that we're, we're uptaking all the nutrition and, and no toxins and heavy metals. So, so it's, it's, it, it, we, have to, we have to really use this information and, and apply it uh, strategically and, and holistically, I think. So how did I come across all this information? Well, in writing the book, Regenerative Soil, which is, which is done really well, um, and people really love it, uh, pe people that I, I have dreamed of reaching out to and, and maybe getting connected with and learning from eventually in my life, um, now recommend it as the book of choice for working with soil. So. Check that out, regenerative soil. Uh, but as I was studying, you know, a new picture began to emerge. And through the research and the journals and the studies, the why behind the inconsistencies in some of my students' results, some of the results I was seeing on other people on YouTube, my own results you know, with the amaranth, you know, and, and some of the inconsistencies I've received from different teachers who are contradicting each other, right? And, and the why behind those things. It, it, it emerged, you know, and, and one of the key things I learned is that there are plants that aren't helping our soils. And um, if we aren't careful with how we're designing things, we have these plants that are just pumping hydroxide into the soil and pushing things further and further away from the ideal, ideal zone for, for plants, which is, you know, 6.5 to 7 pH and 400 to 450 millivolts EH. And so, um, you know, like we, we got to push our, thing, our plants towards the ideal zone so that we stop building a worldwide desert because um, that's essentially what we're doing. Uh, creating more violent weather, creating more high, drastic highs and drastic lows, uh, more fitful rain cycles. Um, it's desertification 101. So uh, it's, I believe it's time to stop this trend. It's not only uh, possible, it's profitable. And it's gonna be fun to do, see, and empowering and exciting for everyone involved. So um, I'm not saying we have to stop growing or eating these things, but I do believe that there are appropriate soil types and places and times to grow these foods. Um, because, uh, I mean, I'm from, you know, was growing in Central California, Southern California, you know, Arizona too has these alkaline oxidized soils naturally and that's why they grow these plants so well. Because it's just, that's the state things are in already. And so, you know what I mean? It's, it's really important to recognize where these things perform really well. So I'm not anti-non-mycorrhizal. Um, these are these are good foods. Um, like like I said, hyperaccumulating means super nutrient dense. If the soils are really healthy, right, and there's good microbes in there and good minerals and nutrients in there, because it, if there's toxins, um, pesticide residues, nitrates, all these things, I mean, they're going to be coming up. Uh, so 
and, they're, they're, and then you look at carbon sequestration. While these plants may not be mycorrhizal, they're non-mycorrhizal, they're still partnering with fungi, archaea, and bacteria in free living associations in endophytic associations and even like like in their leaves and on the surface of the plants so so they're still active you know and have microbes and a microbiome and all those things um, and they still can be reducing you know energy into the soil to a degree um, but they're not going to sequester carbon at any anywhere near the rate they're not going to grow new, more, progressively more nutrient dense plants. They're not going to improve the soil structure and water to retention capabilities, which will you know, change the temperature, change the growing season, change. So many things will be affected when the water systems and the soil can hold more water. All, you know, I, it's just incredible. Uh, when you can elongate and spread out that water pattern rather than it coming in these fitful bursts that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> so you may have noticed in your garden when you know everything else is growing really well and maybe your amaranth and your beets and your chard are suffering or the reverse, maybe they're doing really well and your tomatoes and your peppers you can't get to grow really well, they're not fruiting well. Um, those kinds of things. Uh, those are more fungal, more acidic, uh, and their preferences are more reduced. So what to do about all this? What can we do? <laughs> mm. You can grow things together and spot water, spot spray with your preferred compost teas, foliar sprays, etc. Soil pH, after all, changes micrometer to micrometer. Diversity is where it's at, but you know, that'll work well for, you know, gardeners with the foliar spray or the soil soak, just going around, just spotting everything and knowing the difference between the plants, recognizing them, caring for them individually in a way. The farmer is going to have to do something different, right? They're going to have to pick a zone, a PHEH zone to live in and to, to stick in. And the, the, the incredible thing is that there are many ways to do this. One of the key ways is to create a buffer in your soil so that you're continuously drawing things back towards pH neutral, even though the microbes or the, the minerals, the basic chemistry of the soil may be pushing you more alkaline. If you have organic matter there, it will buffer it. So that's, that's, a, that's an incredible thing that organic matter offers us all and that's why, you know, um, good compost uh, that's aligned with the soil, aligned with the goals, aligned with the microbes of the climate that you're in, um, that's always gonna be beneficial. Even if you're trying to go a little alkaline or a little acidic or something like that, um, it, it, it's always gonna be that buffer that, that uh, draws you back towards, towards neutral. So there are many ways to shift EH and pH like EM, brown rice vinegar watered down, compost teas, biochar even, because pH and EH levels deal with oxidation, organic matter levels, moisture levels, nutrient availability, and much, much more. So if you'd like to learn more about this, please sign up for the free webinar which starts this Thursday. It's on my course platform. There's going to be live Q&A during the webinar, but then there's gonna be, there's gonna be uh, replays all weekend long. So join us for that. It's gonna be incredible. And then on Monday, when you know the replays are ending, the course, the introduction to regenerative soil begins Monday. So it's, it's an introduction to what my book's all about, uh, the how to, the why, condensing it all so that people can really take action and understand it and be able to communicate and understand why um, and, and how the, all these things work and, and get started. Uh, and that's, you know, what, you know, 90% of what people want, right? And then, and then I'll have like the deep dive course later on where we'll go through my book chapter by chapter and section by section, delving deeper and deeper, finding new connections together um, later this spring and summer. So uh, join us for all of it. Um, we'll continue to build and grow as, as, as these courses go together. 
So it's gonna be amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely so excited. As transformative as my PDC was, as learning about permaculture was, regenerative soil has been completely just mind blowing and inspiring and hopeful and exciting and suddenly linking all everything, the health of everything, you know, micro to macro, soil to plant to animal, all of it into one amazing deep understanding that I want to share with everyone and we're gonna be talking about it in the webinar, A New Paradigm in Soil Science. So I hope you join us. I'll be answering all your questions as well this Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Just click the link below and sign up. It's gonna be amazing. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And I'll see you soon. Sign up for the webinar. <laughs>